Fala, capitão! Fala, galera! Eu sou Nicolas César e ao meu lado o mestre capitão Ulisses Abud. Hoje a gente tem a honra de receber conosco um atleta que já foi favorito à vitória em Tour de France, correu do lado de lendas como Lance Armstrong, Alberto Contador, entre outros. Tem muitos quilômetros nas pernas, muita experiência, sobretudo, mas uma visão de mundo única e uma visão do que é o esporte e saúde mental, treinamento mental, sensacional. Ele que é amigo muito próximo do nosso capitão Ulisses, e então agradecer ao Ulisses também que fez a ponte aqui conosco, e apresentar a vocês, Yannis é, Brakovic, direto da Eslovênia, aqui, aqui conosco. Yannis! Uh, I've just done a quick introduction. Uh, it would be impossible for me to to give your whole CV, uh, sportive and coaching uh, wise. So I would just let you introduce yourself to to the Brazilian listeners here. And first of all, it's a huge honor to have you here on the show. I have seen you racing when I was small, and I remember you attacking on the tour and in, in other big races. And it's just uh, just incredible to have you here with us today. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm I'm Yanni Brajkovic. I'm an ex professional rider because I uh, rider because I don't I don't race anymore. Uh, used to race for 15 years. Had some results, some good results, but mainly mainly I think cycling gave me something that I. I, I never thought I could get from cycling and that's a whole different life after cycling, a better life. And I think with my knowledge, what I want to do now with my knowledge and experience, I can help other riders have a better life, a better life that I had during, during my cycling career. That's my goal right now. Yeah, that's uh, somehow super nice uh, what you talk reminds me a lot about some discussions that uh, people tend to have around the Olympics regarding legacy. I think as a cyclist, we, we also have a role in leaving somewhat of a legacy and giving back to, the, to cycling, giving back to bike, giving back to the community, everything it gave to us somehow. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I would say, uh, and this might be a surprise, but cycling for me was, it was my life. And it was my life in a sense, I was addicted to cycling. Cycling was my, cycling was my drug. At that time, I thought I love cycling and I did lo uh, love cycling. I, I love to train, I love to race, but I also, uh, what I figured out, I couldn't, be without, without my bike. And when I was not training for one day, I was a different person. So basically it was an addiction. And that addiction is in a way, it's no different than any, any other addiction. It might be socially more acceptable, but it's still a big problem for, for a person, you know? And I talk with a lot of cyclists, professional cyclists, male and female nowadays, and they have the same problem and they cannot find help because nobody understands them. This is why I want to give back to cycling. I want to help those people, those riders, um, to have a better life, to, to ride because they love to ride, not because they need to ride. That's a, that's a huge difference because once they finish with professional cycling, they lose their identity and they are nothing. And then yeah. they might have a PhD in something, but they have no experience. They don't know how to live. And at that point, usually what happens is they, they divorce from their wife. They, they lose their their money and they start from scratch or they, they just cannot start again and they don't know what to do. And that's what I want to prevent. It's a, it's a big goal, but I think in a way we need to do it because, uh, the way cycling is right now, it's, 
it's it's a very hard sport it gives you a lot it takes you a lot it takes a lot from you and then when you're done with it you are just you're disposable like you're being used and when your services are not are not uh desired anymore you're being disposed and then you're on your own man it's it's incredible because i remember going through some uh, some harsh moments uh, a few years ago uh when turning pro and then trying to find my path and my pleasure uh, within the bike and i remember reading a lot of your tweets and in, in different aspects because it's like you say we kind of become addicted to the bike dependent on a system and kind of afraid of breaking uh breaking out of this uh, of this loophole because we are we think that the ro- the road is going to end i see and and now that i see from a different perspective i see loads and loads of riders who are simply depressive they are in a in a state of depression and it's not only within professional cycling but a lot with amateur cycling because they think if they don't become professional the, their life might end especially within european countries that's something that maybe in brazil we don't see it that much as maybe it's a cultural aspect in in the way that uh, cycling is never really seen uh, as a profession uh for within brazilian culture but i think on that point ulysses can add a little bit more i would like him to let talk not let him talk and introduce uh, a little bit as, as someone who knows deeply brazilian cycling and, and yourself also Gianni. yes this is like taking you know the same train as uh Gianni started to talk about um i think we've been working working together since two and something ago yeah mm-hmm. and i was like yeah. going through some you know issues that he described and i was following him in the social media and i thought wow i think i think this guy will understand what what i'm what I, i'm thinking what i'm i'm going through and then we started a like a very nice relationship which he became much more you know a coach uh, or a, a like a guru a mentor and someone that I'm I'm comfortable to call a friend because it's uh, he's like as you you could realize in the beginning of his his talk is very you know mind orientated uh, so I'm not talking much more about let, let him talk but I think uh usually we always hear about mental toughness and like mind governing body and it sounds like a cliche right and i think maybe this is one of the reasons people don't give the proper value and just realize there's something wrong when it's it's too late and i think yanni's history can like will tell us more about it so yanni tell us about your your story yeah, yeah. thank you i would just thank uh, you. If I may, sorry to to do yeah. a quick uh, a quick parenthesis. First, like uh, Ulysses described it, uh, you are too humble, maybe to to say it. But I would like exactly that to understand better your story and these mental issues and addictions uh, you've mentioned before. To bring it to something touchable for the guys who are listening to the podcast, so that uh, they understand. Because we talk a lot about issues and mental depression and addiction and maybe anorexic and other problems that are created within the world of a professional cyclist, which I like to correlate. It is not only within professional cyclists, but is with any person of a performance person. So the guy who is on the financials, financial system, for example, working on the stock market, uh the doctors who are 24/7 and nearly the uh, whole week full gas so yeah let's go through your story and try to to bring it to something so that people can understand okay perfect first i'd like to talk about dolphin actus i think there's something important i have to say and then i'll go and tell you about my life so dolphin was in 2010 i was supposed to do the tour and one month before the tour, 
uh, we raced to California. And at that race, I asked Johan if, am I going to the tour or not? Or is it decided or not? And he said, there's, sorry, but there's very little chance for you. I said, okay. And then I thought the only way I can get on the team is to race well at Dauphine. And what happened, I fly home from California. I have five days easy. And on the six days, I caught a stomach bug. So I couldn't eat. I wasn't nauseous, anything. I was just like, I wasn't digesting anything. In the morning, I would have breakfast and that breakfast would be in my stomach for dinner. So first day, because I was supposed to train, I trained, of course. First day I do three hours and I'm, I'm done after three hours. The second day I do three and a half hours and I'm, I'm like, I'm like death, like white, pale, I couldn't write. And then I was this, this here, you can see how determined I was, how ignorant I was uh, about my body. I decided to go to the mountains here in Slovenia and do like three, four days of good training with my stomach bug. I go to the mountains and I do four days, five to six hours every day. After three hours, uh, remember, I wasn't eating anything. I had breakfast, full stomach, but I wasn't digesting anything. Three hours, I was finished, and then I had to stop. Every 20 minutes, I stopped to rest, and then 20 minutes, stop, rest, 20 minutes riding, stop, rest. So in the end, I did three days, four days. It was uh, 20, 22, 23 hours of training. And then the fifth day, it was an easy day, and I felt a little bit better. The sixth day, I met a friend and he was doing some intervals and they had a car. So I said, okay, can I go with you? You're doing like, let's say zone four, zone five on a climb behind the car. And at that moment, I was like, man, I'm, I'm feeling good. Like I was doing 380, 390 watts and easy, like really easy. I do that interval, I go home, and I called my coach and I told him I'm ready. And for the next two days, I did, I did one hour, two hours. And my stomach uh, bug was, was going away. I was, I was feeling better. And then comes Dauphine. Dauphine prologue, prologue is not my, my discipline. It's too short. I'm slow. And uh, I was good at long time trials, but not prologues. And I get third and I'm like, Okay, that's, it's going well. Stage one, um, I'm doing really well. Stage two, even better. I think stage four was the time trial. I do the time trial after 15 kilometers, there was a climb, I'm climbing and I'm like climbing in a position and there's like, I see one, one ski is further, further um, out than the, the next one, the left one. And I try to move it and it falls out. So I'm like, okay, I have to stop. I stop, I turn around, the car is behind me and I'm like throwing the bike and the guys in car are like, what? So finally they give me a new bike and I go to the finish. I win the time trial. I win it by, I think it was 20, 30 seconds to David Miller. Contador lost one minute and a half. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna win this race. This is, this is easy. And seriously, like the stage to Alto is, and this might sound I'm bragging, but I'm really not. This was the, the, the only race in my career when I never, ever had pain in the legs, never. It was the easiest race in my career. If I, if I had to go all out on outdoors on, uh, the last stage on, on any other stage, 
On Outdoors, I would be two minutes quicker than Contador easily. On the last stage, I would be one. I, I would put one minute into Contador. But because I was not confident in myself, I, I always always had doubts. What if my team? Because we had a honestly, we had a B team at the race. It was not an A team. So I was very conservative. And then after I win the race and people would expect, well, they're going to celebrate. He's super happy. He must be proud of himself. And I really felt nothing. There was nothing. It was just as my goal was always racing the tour, finish on the podium, not winning the tour because I was also a realist, but I wanted to finish on the podium. And I felt nothing. And then two days later, Lance calls me. Do you want to do the tour? Yeah, sure. Okay, you're doing the tour. And that's how I raced that, raced that tour. If I hadn't won the Dauphine, there would be no tour for me. I have a question that, were you enjoying the life as a professional cyclist at the moment? Or were you just living the problems? I had no life. I only had cycling. There was no life. There was wake up, train, come home, eat, do something with a computer or, or just rest, do nothing, go to bed, wake up again and ride. When I, like 2006, 7, let's say 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I was away from home for like 250 days a year. I, w I was running away from home. I was running away from reality. And cycling was my illusion. When, when the season stopped, then when there's no training, there's no races, the weather's dark and wet and, and, and foggy, then you see who you are. Like I, I, will, I couldn't survive. Like I was depressed all the time. And then on top of that, I, my first year of, no, let's say, yeah, my first year of, uh, of uh, professional um, cycling career, I already started with an eating disorder. So what happened? I was addicted to cycling and I had bulimia. That's another, another uh, form of addiction, mental disorder. So cycling didn't, didn't do it for me. It wasn't enough. So I needed an extra help. Because the thing is, if you have enough energy in your body, you can feel your body better. And emotions are made in the body. Emotions don't, don't, uh, are not created in your mind. Emotions are created in your body and they, then you, they go to, to your mind and you become aware of them. So when you deplete your body of energy, there's less emotions. Let's say you have a person who's starving for 30 days. That person has no emotions at all. There's nothing. That was me, but I did my cycling. At the end of the day, I was tired. I was out of energy and it still wasn't enough. So I came up with another way of getting rid of that energy, which is purging. And that's how I coped with it. But in cycling nowadays, this is, this is a problem that nobody's gonna, gonna go into. They don't want to hear it. Like when you start talking in about cycling people, and sorry to say in society, man. Yeah, because oh, of course. In the end, uh, I like to correlate it a lot. Like what we live as sportsmen, it, it correlates to a lot of aspects of our modern society. And in the end, society has at the moment, it's a very harsh talk, but we have no time for losers and being pity. If you are sad, then it's your problem. In the end, there are some people uh, like you are doing now 
who try to help out, but mostly if you are not fitting into the system, if you don't fit into the system of the rotor teams, you are disposable. We just uh, gonna find someone else who fits, do the work. It's a business in the end. We are it in is, a business in, in, in the entertainment business. But, business. but it's a broken business and it shouldn't be like this. Like there's, there's some things that could be done and everything would work better. If you look cyclists right now, cyclists are like professional cyclists are like monkeys in the circus. That's it. As you said, they are disposable. It's like a water bottle. You use it, you throw it away. And that's it. And this could, this could change. Yanni, yeah. uh, like how much would you say, uh, like in a percentage that uh, what caused your eating disorder was like the environment of cycling as today's like the fitness environment and, you mm -hmm. know, the social media, like um, requesting more and more, you know, beauty of people. Uh, how much do you think it was the environment and how much it was uh, trauma from your childhood? Yeah, so uh, it was 100% trauma. In the beginning, I thought, because my full-blown eating disorder started, let's say, 2004, 2005. And at that point, I was still on an under-23 team here in my town. And there was a lot of bullying and everything on the team. And that's how it started. So I thought this guy is, is who, who started everything. And I, I, um, I had bulimia because of this guy, but then with my therapist, we went back and it basically started when I was a child, it was as a child, I remember I had periods when I would eat, there was one food I would, we, I would eat all the time. And you remember when I was talking about depleting your energy, so you don't feel emotions as a child, I would go 24 hours without, without food, being outside and I was fine. And that's a way of not, uh, preventing yourself to feel and when i had those periods when i would eat only one food it was either let's say bread and jam uh, for like three months only one food um, i would eat chocolate milk i had like three liters of chocolate milk a day and nothing else that was my food and my parents didn't figure it out because before I didn't want to eat anything and now I'm eating something which is better than nothing. So they were happy, right? And this is how it started. And what happened in cycling, cycling is an environment that allows this to happen, allows um, eating disorder to develop because it's the weight is very important in cycling. Um, and, and you have to eat a huge amount of calories. If you want to train hard, uh, emotions are still there. So you figure it out pretty quickly in the beginning. It's like, oh, this is, this is cool. I can, I can eat whatever I, I want and I can control my weight and this is good. But very quick, quickly, you figure out, oh man, I'm not in control of this. This is in control of me. The food is controlling me. I'm, can I, can I, can I say uh, bad words? I was like, I'm fucked. And this went on until two years ago. This is, this is like, this was going on for 17, 16 years. And I tried everything. Like I, I, I really tried everything. Nothing worked until I met this guy who has this method and who is 
the most important part is he tries to go with you back in your childhood start from there and just dig and dig and dig and we find we found out things that i i thought were not important but they were really important and then when you understand why this is happening then you can start resolving it and what i thought what i believed let's say two years ago before i started with uh, this therapist i was like okay i have a family i have three kids uh i have an eating disorder and this eating disorder is gonna kill me 100 percent. i cannot change it this is it and i'm okay with it there's not no other way it was that it was that hard and it was cruel but uh, luckily i i visited that guy we had first session it was two hours of just pure talk and then the second session and and after the first session everything stopped one session i'm not saying that after one session i was fixed because i'm still not fixed but if you talk to me two years ago, well, you wouldn't talk to me because I wouldn't answer the phone. No way. I was I was a completely different person two years ago. Like the the worst nightmare for me would be talk to a stranger on Zoom or real life or whatever. Just I was like, leave me alone, let me do my thing. I will train, I will race. Other than that, leave me alone. I was alone. I had no friends. I pushed everyone away. I was lonely, but I didn't know how, how, to, how to make it work because when, when you have an eating disorder, you cannot be close with anyone because they might see through you, you know? Then you push every, everyone away and suddenly you're alone. What was the wake up call for you, Yanni, to see that something was not uh, on the right direction? <laughs> there were there were many wake up calls. Um, the, the one thing that I I got terrified because all time along I knew I was I was fucked. I knew and I knew how badly I was fucked. But what scared the shit out of me was seeing my 10 year old son becoming a copy of me. And that's scary. Because I don't want my kids to have the, the life that I had. That, that was the scariest thing. Because it's, it's hard to admit. Well, it's not hard to admit. It's hard to accept. What has been done to me in my childhood? The same thing with different methods I've done to my kids. The end result is the same now in the past two years that I'm changing as a person as who I am my wife is changing we're all changing my kids are, are changing as well and that's that's what really matters for me it's not that I'm never gonna crash again and I can ride my bike faster than ever uh, it's it's that my family has a better life and that my kids have a father that they deserve, that my wife has a husband that she deserves. That's what's important. This brings to, to one point that I think is like to, for, for people listening here to us, you seek it for help, but many people seem to be afraid of seeking out for help. How important is this, uh, Yanni? To be, to be honest, when you are suffering from an eating disorder, the last thing you want 
is tell it to a stranger or to a friend. You want to keep it for yourself because you are the amount of shame that you have in you is I cannot describe it. It's it's nothing. I cannot compare it to anything else. It's it's so huge that even if you are about to die, you're not going to tell it. It's that hard. Why is that? Because in my years, eating disorder, especially inside, I was, I was in Astana. You couldn't talk to anyone. There, there was nobody qualified. There was nobody who, who would want to talk about it. There was a doctor once. He figured it out. So he came and talked to me. And of course, at that time, I wasn't ready. As I said, no, nothing's going on. I'm just uh, eating uh, in deficit at home. And then I'm trying to compensate the race. So that's why I'm eating this much food. And he said, OK, but if you want help, I'm here. And what happened? The next day, the whole team knew. The whole team knew that I had an eating disorder. So you know that they know, and how can you talk to them honestly? Like you're always lying to them. You cannot have a good relationship with your teammates, with your DSs, with your doctor, with your mechanic, because they all know, and you know that they know. But what I want to do, I want to, that's why I'm, I'm talking about it. I want others to to have somebody they can talk to and i'm talking to a lot of riders right now who are suffering from an eating disorder i'm talking to to world tour women who never knew about me who don't know me who i never met they send me text and i'm like Let's do a Zoom. I will not fix you. I'm not qualified for that. But I will listen and I will understand and I will not judge. And after 50 minutes of talking, it's like it's such a relief for them because finally there's somebody who understands them, who feels what they feel. And that's, that's the answer. Like, let's talk about it. I always said, there's a problem. If you have a problem, let me know. I'll listen. I'll talk to you. And unfortunately, right now, I'm, I'm the only one. Uh, Yanni, uh, this would be my, my question. So do you think, not in the pro peloton, but in general, do you think women tend to suffer more with eating disorder than men because in sports, not only because of performance, but, but also because of society, of image. And the second uh, and related to this question is, okay, uh, when it's, you realize when it's too late, but there is some signs that you can, uh, previously detect and think, wow, I'm going, I'm going the, the wrong way. And you can fix before it's too late or before it takes too time to be fixed. Yeah, I, I think like before and still now, I think generally it's thought that women tend to suffer more if you, if you look percentage wise. Uh, and and men are like there's almost no eating disorders in men let's say professional peloton but the the irony is when when i had an eating disorder so when you're suffering you can almost sense people who are on the same boat your teammates and there was let's say a team of 30 riders there were six or seven riders 
who will who were like me the same the other problem is you have an eating disorder you have anorexia you have bulimia but then you have disordered eating which can lead to eating disorder and disordered eating is like i see guys who are counting calories all the time who are dreaming about their dinner about they they eat the dinner and then they are uh dreaming about uh and then about this food and that food and that what they're gonna do in the off season and and they are so stressed and so obsessed with food the calories the the macronutrients micronutrients uh carb phobic fat phobic uh and, and all this that's not that's not the way to go like human body is is intelligent enough to to know when you have enough energy in yourself when to eat when not to eat what's good for you what's not good for you you shouldn't be counting calories all day one question uh Gianni, and i think this relates a little bit to cultural aspects uh do you you, you mentioned the riders and the women's Maybe they have something closer. But I see a lot of a relation to cultural background from people who tend to go that direction. Uh, I don't want to say my opinion. I want to listen to yours before I, I give my opinion within like a yeah. country the person comes from and those things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When, when I was under 23, we would race in Italy a lot. And in Italy, they would have... There were Italian teams, but they would bring uh, Eastern riders, right? And those Eastern riders, they didn't have anything. So those team bosses, they basically owned them. And for the breakfast, the team owner or director sportif or whoever, they would bring the food on the table and tell them, this is what you have to eat. This is what is not allowed. And then that was at the race. Out of the race, when they were training, they had a team house. And the coach would say he would, uh, it was uh, on the coast of Italy. They would take them to the, to the coast, to the beach. The coach said, this is the virtual line. You cannot cross. And then they weren't allowed to eat ice cream. They weren't allowed to eat sugar. They weren't allowed to eat uh, soft drink, uh, drink soft drinks. It was extremely strict. And those, I know a few, those riders, they developed eating disorder. Or when they could, when the boss was not there, they would go to, uh, to the bakery or to have like, one kilo of ice cream you know it does come from certain countries and when you think also the countries where life was harder it tend, tends to come from those countries but it's not only those countries but if you if if we look percentage wise there's more eating disorders more addictions uh, in cycling from those countries. Yeah, yeah it, it, it relates a lot to my, I see that there's a lot of, um, especially Latin countries. I think there's more of this um, traditionalism over what you should eat, what you should not eat, uh, that is very empirical. Maybe now with the addition of technology, Ulysses can tell us more. He's the Mr. Super Sapiens saying glucose uh, patches. Uh, we have been seeing that these changes, for example, uh, eating huge amounts of carbs, but especially in those more traditional Latin countries is where I see the most of disorders and the most pressure of traditionalism and this military way of going. Old school cycling, you could say, as you mm -hmm. said, Italy, Spain, Portugal, France, uh, even uh, within South America, the, there is a big influence of um, uh, Spanish, Italian, 
and this this uh, areas uh, these cyclings in in the development of those cyclings but it's something i never saw that much in for example uh, it exists, obviously, but I did never saw a lot within British cycling, within Belgium cycling, where they, I had the opportunities. Uh, Australians, they tend to fall in between. Dutch, never. Uh, not never, but it was not something uh, you usually see, nor Germans, nor, any, nor things like that. And also something I didn't see a lot in mountain bike, coming from this background. It's something that is really related more related to road cycling where this uh, tradition uh, tends tends to happen yeah there's one thing though when you have an athlete with bulimia you will not figure it out if you weren't if you didn't have bulimia and you know how it looks how it feels you yeah, cannot follow it out. i think you put it is uh, straight off a uh, straight after it. You have yeah. different levels, but for example, today I sit at a table and I just for or, or go out for a ride. And if you stop at a coffee shop and you see the reaction of the person or the first comment the person does when stopping at a coffee shop, I know you have had a coach who was uh, an yeah. asshole to you. Sorry for the yeah. say. <laughs> and you can clearly see if the person has any traits of. Yeah. Uh, of problems by the first thing that he says when he stops at the coffee shop or yeah. mentioning a coffee stop. Yeah. It's yeah. weird, right? Yeah. Yeah. So do you think analyzing the last five years, let's say, and looking forward to the next five years, maybe, do you think cycling uh, has been improving and, you know, like, uh, people are giving more attention to the mind issues and like eating disorder or do you think it's still the same because it's not spoken and do you think it's uh, of course it's still an issue in the, in the, the pro peloton uh, or in the society but do you think we are in the way even if it's like a like a doing small things, but do you think we are in the way to treat this issue in the right way or not, or is the same? In order to, to fix the issue of an addiction, you would have to fix their childhoods. That's number one. Number two, the environment that professional cyclists, the teams that they live in and race in is in a way it's better, in other way it's, it's worse. I know a couple World Tour teams, I know their general manager, I know all the people on the team, but what they do with their riders and this this is not just about eating disorder. This is about how they treat them, how they respect them, how, how, uh, what relationships they, they have towards the riders. It's extremely bad. It is extremely bad. There are riders of one team, 80% of them want to change the team they want to change the team because it's unbearable like they are yelled on they are they they are told they are worthless they they it's it is incredible what is happening but then on the outside you see this great team with great results and everything's fine and I, I think that in order to change things, we would have to bring in people who are not from cycling, who are not ex riders, who are not uh, general manager's friend, who are not uh, director sportives 
I don't know, cousin, people who are not educated for the job they have. Being a general manager or being a director sportif is huge responsibility. And you, if you don't have any training in working with people, how to, how to talk to them, how to motivate them, the, you cannot work with them. They are not, they are not machines. They have feelings and that's what they forget, or that's what they don't want to admit to themselves. And that's how things go bad. Yeah. You've mentioned this point, uh, bringing people from outside. Do you see any of the current teams doing that? bringing this different approach and that's why they are being successful i name a little bit on ineos and a little bit on jumbo at the moment yeah yeah i i think ineos the, the problem well right now i don't know but a few years back the problem with ineos was it was a very strict environment and many riders couldn't handle it, especially Spanish riders. Some of, of the Spanish riders, they, they, the Spanish riders like to be free, easygoing, you know, but in Ineos, there was like order. You have to do this, 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 this is your diet. This, these are your carbs. Um, yeah, Ineos, uh, they, they brought a few, let's say outsiders. I think one of the teams that could do that as well is EF, because um, I think Jonathan Waters is very open-minded and he's ready to, to try uh, different things. Um, but if you look those tradi traditional teams, uh, I'm not going to name them, but you'll figure it out, or teams who are really... Uh, it's a some of the teams are are like a closed environment and there's nobody coming in like this is us yes he knows things but he cannot he cannot enter because what what's gonna happen is like back in the mind they know that they don't have the qualifications to run the team like they should so they're not going to hire a guy who is smarter than them because uh, they still want to be bosses they still want to be the smartest the, the the people who decide everything there's quite a few teams uh, in a world tour like this so how do you do you explain the the huge power of Slovenia in cycling now. It's such a, like a small country, but with so many great riders. Yeah, it, it's, it's incredible, right? Because when you look, uh, when one mile record was broken, sub four minutes, before it was broken, they said it's impossible. You cannot do it. It's impossible. When it was broken in the in that year or following year, I don't know how, how many runners broke four mi minute mile. And in Slovenia, I think it's the same. When Slovenians are very very competitive, very competitive, and when they see a Slovenian going well and and riding well and winning races it will motivate them and it will basically show them that it's possible it's he's not he's not a robot he's not from another planet he's a slovenian he's maybe a little bit better than me but i can do it as well and that's what's happening the the thing that worries me right now and honestly, I'm not, I'm not so deep in Slovenian youth. What's gonna happen after five, six, seven years when Roglic's gone, when 
Pogacar's gone. Because uh, right now we we don't really have many huge talents like Pogacar was. You know, and what's gonna happen with the with the public? Because like, now if if they don't win, that's that's bad news. That's oh he lost. Yeah, but he finished second. No, he lost. He has to win. And now the bar is so high that when after five or 10 years, when results are not there anymore, what's going to happen then? Because Slovenians also also get spoiled, you know, and like in every nation, uh, some people don't understand cycling. Well, they think they do, but it's not that easy. Uh, Roglic and, and Pogacar are super talents, really super talents. Uh, but they are also hard workers. Pogacar is lucky. Well, he would be he would be winning anyways. But he an extra bonus for him is working with Inigo San Milan. I worked with Inigo, and two months ago, Pogacar sent me a message and he said, this is the message from Inigo. I think you should, uh, you should read it. And Inigo wrote, I, I'm 100% sure that Yanni could have won the tour, but he just didn't listen. He just didn't listen. And I wasn't like he was coaching me. Inigo was coaching me, and what he was telling me, I understood. And and I was really into science and everything. I understood, but I couldn't. I couldn't do three hours, and then have a rest day afterwards, or do seventeen hours or twenty hours a week. I had to do thirty hours. That 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 was my drug. But hashtag it's all about that pace mitochondria adaptation but that yeah. keeps a uh, team for another program we need to have you again man do a part two sure. of this conversation going a little bit more into training method methods and um this may be the second part of your of your career this this leaves us a uh, part two uh within two weeks but i will really have to to put uh to put the flag down because we are coming down to the line and we need to sprint for it <laughs> uh, <laughs> and i think who, cool. who takes the victory uh, the guy who's listening to us man uh yeah. for sure because this is an incredible um incredible uh life experience and i think a really eyes opening experience for many people who i'm sure that are listening here to us and will somehow see similarities uh, or don't but for sure we'll, we'll have something that they can apply uh, to their own uh, life and um, and learn out of it uh, yeah, i don't know ulysses yeah. would you like to to say some uh, some final words as well yeah just <clears throat> just would like to to thank yanni for his time and once again like learning and learning with him uh, and it was a very profound conversation and uh, I appreciate a lot like the way he speaks out about himself and it's very you know like he's very humble and I think cycling needs a lot more people like him so thank you a lot Yanni oh thank you very much thank you yeah you know I try to tell the truth but I also try not to tell the cruel truth because that will scare people away. So I think at least today I found a good balance. Um, and, and I think a lot of people will find themselves in, in my story. And, and more importantly, a lot of people will will see that change is possible and change is possible it's not easy it's not a quick fix 
but it's possible. Yeah. For you that uh, listened, uh, once again, this was a little bit of a longer conversation, but I hope you guys enjoy it. I'm sure we're going to have Yanni on our next podcast pretty soon. And if you have any questions you would like to ask to Yanni and maybe be the topic for a next, uh, a next episode, please send us. You can send uh, to Yanni himself if you would like. We will tag Yanni on the, on the social media here. Uh, his his different social medias. I'm sure he would be happy to to answer. Or you can send to me and Ulysses in Portuguese or in English. We'll be happy to make the teams for another another episode.